All right, good afternoon. And, uh, oh, we don't have our wrists. <laughs> so, Vine and Peter, would you like to join us? Sure. I should have grab another chair here. Yeah. Good afternoon and, and welcome back to the House Environment and Energy Committee. We're going to continue our discussion of H687 and welcome Sabina Haskell and Peter Gill from the Natural Resources Board. Thank you very Thank much, you. Chair Sheldon. I'd also like to take a moment to introduce our general counsel, Allison Hilberry Stower, who's with us today. Um, we've been uh, talking a lot about the bill and uh, moving forward with it and everything, and we're very delighted to know that there's so much interest. Uh, and making making the necessary updates. So thank you for that. Um, you invited us to talk about Tier 1A and B today. Good. And I just want to make some general comments about our study process. Again, I know you've invited us in here prior to talk about the overview and everything, but um, we see this uh, as a framework, as you know, and that it would be important to integrate the designation, <clears throat> excuse me, and mapping studies, and that there is an, uh, my, I hope that we, I hope that there could be a framework that gets legislated, if you will, this year, and then the opportunity for us to take the time and have the input and uh, conversations with stakeholders, our study partners, municipalities, Vermonters, about uh, how the tiers will be uh, set up and how the regional mapping will be worked. And um, so with those overview comments, I would respectfully ask that we could, first step would be to get a professional board so that they can be responsible uh, for getting these processes and implementation into place. And I think we all recognize that there's going to be some complications and details that need to be worked out and that we would bring to the legislature um, and with timelines and implementation. I was had been hoping to share an implementation timeline with you today, but uh, we agree with others who have testified that, well, let me step back for a minute. We're hoping that these new tiers jurisdiction and mapping and everything goes into effect so that it's seamless with the, end, the ending or the uh, expiration sunsetting of the Home Act exemption so that it just moves on. But we would, once the decision is made when those exemptions end, then we would do our planning for the timeline because right now in your technical corrections bill, Senator Bongard, there's a you know 2028 feels like it's way too far away, but that that can be worked yeah. out and we will work with the timelines and come back and report to you on all of that. Um, the tier one and B areas are meant to encourage compact growth where we want it and help keep keep the working and vast more rural areas of the state protected um, and also encouraging growth and uh, housing and economic development in the more rural, excuse me, centers. Beyond that, I'm not sure I, I can keep going, but I think you've heard a lot of this before and I'm happy to answer questions. We are working on some draft language suggestions for you all. Um, and we hope to have those in by the end of the week, fingers crossed. Um, and maybe to just set back, yes. set back really, really briefly, if I may, um, on the tier one, just reminder of the committee, tier one A and B, kind of two different, two different areas that were proposed under the study. Uh, again, for um, growth and compact set settlement uh, um, to promote that. And um, and basically looking at areas where there are uh, zoning and subdivision bylaws, uh, wastewater, uh, water. Um, but again, depending on uh, the either A or B, uh, whether you fall into either of those kind of depends on some of those criteria. Again, the study got to kind of a broad level of what some of those criteria and standards would be, but didn't hone in on um, uh, all the details and really 
again, uh, looked at the, the mapping and the integration with the mapping and designations to help uh, flesh that out. And I think that goes to what Sabine is talking about in terms of setting up a timeline to make those um, decision points. And I just thought of one more thing. I'm going to cut you off. I apologize. The, the idea is not to reduce reduce the criteria or have it have the criteria be overlooked. That they that this moving on to these exemptions, the municipalities will be able to be able will need to be able to demonstrate that the criteria are be are being followed. And that's part of the reason why we need a process to set up the, I keep calling it a certification so that we know that they can do what we think they can do in 1A and 1Bs. I'm sorry to interrupt. I interrupted you, the question. No. Okay. Is it if that? Uh, I, I just need a quick refresher. This is, this is about the uh, professional board uh, issue. Uh, uh, is, is there also a change in the, process for making the appointments, or is it just a, a, a more detailed description of the qualifications? I think there'll be a change in the how the professional board is chosen, as well as in their qualifications. Okay. Yes, and um, I think that it's, I think there's still debate whether it should be a three-person board or a five-person board yeah. with a full-time chair. Um, and how that nominating committee gets set up. And I can go into a couple of thoughts on that, but I, I was going to do that on Friday when no, we no, talked that, about that, okay. that, That's the level I, I needed to okay. be reminded. So thank you. Um, anything else you would like us to understand about your proposed tier one and A and B? Only thing in terms of that overview is just the jurisdiction in those areas. Uh, Active 50 would be exempt from those areas, just to remind you. Representative Bongar. So in tier 1B, you have the uh, <clears throat> units of housing would, would trigger. Yeah. Well, I'll take a comment. I, I think the committee is going to want to go as far as we can and give definition now to, oh. to exactly how this is going to work. We won't, obviously, we won't get everything done, and there will be a lot of work done afterwards. But I think that, uh, I think. At least for my part, I don't want to um, kind of do only a little bit and then go back to a whole nother. We've been, we've been having public processes for 20 years on this. And, um, yeah. and I, so we, we have to do more and that can get incorporated. But I just want to send a signal that um, not, we're gonna, from my perspective anyway, I want to give as much definition to this as we can now. So I want to really understand how we're going to do the one A and the one B, and and I don't you know and critical uh, habitat, or critical uh, resource areas, our natural resource areas are critical natural resource areas. So I want to, I think for my opinion anyway, I want to give definition to that. So I'm just doing that now. I really want to give definition to the categories in the future land use maps, and. There will still be a lot of public process involved in this in the life, bottom up, and, and the towns meeting the regions, and all of that will be going on at the same time. But I um, just want to send a signal to the world, at least for my part, not interested in having this be totally nebulous and go through another. I just want to make sure I'm, I heard you clearly that you would it, it would be your preference to have the definitions of tier one A and B in legislation this year, as well as the other def, uh, as well as the other tiers two and three. Well, yes. Yeah. Okay. That I was not. A, I guess yeah. that that's yeah. catching me a little bit by surprise because I think it. I personally think it needs time to be fleshed out. But. But well, I guess what I would say is I want to get as far as we can, as close as we can. Get some legislative definition for this. Okay. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, next up, we have Catherine Dimitri. Hello, thanks for having me back. It's nice to see all of you again. I'm Catherine Dimitrick with Northwest Regional Planning Commission, and I serve as chair of the Vermont Association of Planning and Development Agencies as well. 
I just wanted to take some time to speak about tiers 1A and 1B as asked. First, I'll just note that the Regional Planning Commission's future land use study that you heard about earlier had some recommendations in it that would add definitions to these areas that I think could work quite well for a legislative consideration. And Charlie Baker, when he speaks, will talk to that a little bit more. We do have some language drafted that I think could be useful for you in your deliberations. The process that the Regional Planning Commission envisioned for tiers 1A and 1B were that the Regional Planning Commissions would do the planning work in cooperation with our municipalities to map these areas. And in our vision, once those maps and plans were accepted by this new environment, the new ERB, then tier 1B would automatically confer to those planned growth areas and the smaller village areas. From there, if a municipality wanted to demonstrate that they meet a certain set of criteria through local bylaws, et cetera, then they could apply for and receive the tier 1A exemption. And the reason why we recommend that process in our report is really from an equity perspective for our smaller communities. I have some concern that the process laid out in 687 as drafted, and I know it's an early draft, um, would really be a challenge and a hurdle for our smaller communities to achieve the 1B status, which is why our recommendation was that the regional planning work would allow the 1B status to confer to these areas upon approval and acceptance of our regional plan and a demonstration that those areas make sense and meet the statutory definitions. Can I just ask a follow-up before? Sure. The 1B currently has a 50 unit exemption, which seems like a lot for these small towns. Do you have a different recommendation or perspective on that? I do have a different perspective. I actually think that that makes a lot of sense. And, and let me tell you why. Um, right now, we currently regulate commercial development far less stringently under Act 250 than we do uh, residential development. So if you look at an area in a village that has access to water and sewer, because of the Home Act that was passed last year, the municipality has to allow five units per acre. So if you want to take advantage of that on, an, like say, a 9.9 .9 acre lot and do 45 units of housing, you would need to go through Act 250. But if it's a commercial project, commercial projects up to 10 acres are exempt in communities with, with um, zoning and subdivision. So you could do that development. And so without going through Act 250, so you look at a 10 acre commercial development, you know, just under 9.9 .9 acres, that could go through without needing Act 250. A 50 unit housing development is essentially that same equal approach from the residential perspective, because the Home Act would require a town to allow five units an acre. So you're essentially bringing residential development to the same equivalent jurisdiction as commercial development. So from that perspective, I actually do think it makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> there may be another way to look at that, but I will. I'll, I'll just have my opinion. <laughs> sure. Um, and so because of that, I, I could go into specific recommendations on some of the standards in 687 if you prefer, or I could follow up in writing, whichever you prefer. I think if you've prepared comments, we'd love to hear them. Sure. Um, so a couple of things I'll point out um, in the proposed requirements starting on page 48 of the bill is um, for, if you're thinking about these for the tier 1A, I have some concerns about what letter E means, that uh, permanent zoning that don't include broad exemptions for significant private or public land development. I think that's just a little vague and I'm not sure what the intent is there. Um, I'm sorry, I missed for letter C, the flood hazard and river corridor bylaws, just an acknowledgement that that's a hurdle that many municipalities would need to meet. That would be a new standard that a lot of municipalities don't actually currently meet. Which, uh, frankly, we're hoping moves in another bill. Okay. But it's in here. All right, so I'll so ignore that comment. <laughs> yeah, to in place. That's, that's too big. That's a, what page you want? I'm on page 48 of draft 1.1. I'm hoping that's still the draft you're on. <laughs> okay, good. Sorry. 
So again, letter E, I thought was vague and it would just be interesting to understand mm -hmm. the intent um, and could certainly make some recommendations to clarify the language once the intent is understood. Um, for letter F, the urban form bylaws, I think requiring at least six stories would most likely be a barrier for many communities choosing to take advantage of tier 1A exemption. I think it it's, makes sense in some of our most urban, most dense municipalities, parts of our most urban, most dense municipalities, but requiring um, reasonable allowance for six stories as a, as a floor, I think is a barrier that would be, would prevent many municipalities from taking advantage of the 1A exemption. So I'm not disagreeing with you, but can you speak a little bit more about that? Why is it a, um, what, what would keep them from adopting that? I think because if you look at the way our downtowns have developed, having a six story building would be immediately out of scale with many of these areas, the broader areas. Not that it doesn't make sense in some parts of what might be a tier 1A area, but to have it be a blanket uh, requirement, I think it would just be out of scale. Um, not, and letter E. Jump in here on that. Um, we had, we've had Gus Felix mm -hmm. in that seat um, over the course of a few years talking yeah. about the need if we're going to build affordable housing to go up. Yes. So when um, this does talk about within some places within those areas, it doesn't, you know, it leaves, it leaves it up to the communities to decide where. And I guess I I would ask, given given that testimony that we've had over the years from Gus in particular, uh, if you think six is too high, is, is five too high? Or, I mean, how do we how do I don't, reconcile these two? <clears throat> I don't know that I could give you a one-size-fits-all answer to that question. And I think that's the issue. Um, and it, as it's drafted right now, make reasonable provision, make reasonable provision. I don't know if that means reasonably allowed everywhere in the tier 1A area or, you know, one block in the downtown. I don't know what that means. And so I read it as reasonably allowing it everywhere in the tier 1 area. What if it were the second? Because that's what I think you I'd still have to think about whether six is the appropriate minimum. And obviously, in the places that it makes sense, we want you to be able to build up, 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 up. But, but what the right minimum is, I don't know right now. And so, you know, the intent here was to, was to keep in that so the town had to identify some area with, with the walkability and access to services that would be allowed. Okay, so now that I understand the intent a little bit more, let me think on that. Okay. Yeah, okay. You know, and I need to answer that question. Um, under letter H, I was just trying to understand the reasoning for having wildlife habitat planning bylaws in the planned growth areas, simply because it would be the understanding where we are mapping these planned growth areas that that would be our highest, most intense use, and it would largely not include wildlife habitat planning areas. And so just trying to understand the interplay between those two, which seem at odds a little bit. I think we're just saying in, in um, the reality is that we, I, I see the future as, as humans and the natural environment being more integrated. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine us restoring the river corridors throughout our built environment, mm -hmm. um, we're going to have wildlife. And uh, there was a moose killed in downtown Burlington this past year. Yeah. That the wildlife is there. And I think we need to make sure that they can, you know, still travel through places we live. Okay. It's not to say that it would be a priority in that area, but where it was a necessary habitat, it would need to be included. Okay, that's great. Thank you for explaining that. So now that I understand the context, I'll probably come back with some recommendations there. Okay. And then um, when it comes to the tier 1B, so moving on to, kind of falls into page 50, Tier 1B requires a municipality in this draft to have a municipal plan, that's letter A, that makes sense, to have permanent zoning and subdivision under letter E, which I think with some wording changes can make sense. It also requires those municipalities to have permitted water and wastewater 
I think it makes more sense to be flexible here for tier 1B to have it be water or wastewater or a demonstration that a community system can work because there's appropriate soils. And there's great examples of this all through rural Vermont where, you know, recently Cathedral Square opened a fantastic housing development in the town of South Hero, which doesn't have water and sewer, but they had a community system and a fire district, so they were able to make it all work. So I think flexibility there is really important. And then I don't think that it's important for tier 1B municipalities to have municipal staff. I think that that is also a requirement that would get in the way of um, municipalities across the state from taking advantage of the tier 1B opportunities. <clears throat> So I'm happy to follow up in writing with, um, with what I just sent you. Um, so the tier 1B requirements are on the top of page 50. It kind of starts at the bottom of 49 and rolls into 50, and it references back those letters in the previous section. And the staff one is which letter? J. J. So um, I don't think we were imagining the town would necessarily have to have staff, but that the, they would have access to staff like at the Regional Planning Commission. So we're um, not anticipating necessarily that they would, but that they had adequate support. Okay, because right now it's drafted as municipal staff. So those were my specific comments on that section at Tier 1A and 1B as drafted currently. I'm happy to follow up with some um, after hearing some more from you and, and to answer some of your questions. And I'll just note, which I, I don't think echoes are your earlier witnesses, which is that depending upon the timeline, I think it will be important to either extend or maybe even perhaps expand the temporary exemptions that were put in place through the Home Act to make sure that we continue to support the development of new housing in the places we want it. Thank you for your testimony. I look forward to the written part. We have a, a couple of questions. Representative Sibelia. And Stephen? Do you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, I just, I, I actually just want to flag the conversation on municipal and the difference between um, what I'm hearing uh, as of the draft and, and what is exists here. Uh, so RPC staff being adequate. Well, that, we need to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. And it, so that's, Feels like that's much more accessible, but also needs a lot more definition. Um, yeah. And that could be one place um, to get toward um, encouraging municipal participation in regional planning processes. Which <clears throat> is something we talked to me before. Thanks, Thanks, Chair. Uh, I do not live in breathe planning, so <laughs> sorry for this. Probably wow, Gabrielle, you should know this already. Question. Um, I guess for me, tier one B, you only trigger Act 250 if it's 50 units mm -hmm. or more. But I guess for me, that seems um, uh, concerning. If on the other hand, you're also saying that we're not sure they can actually jump through these hoops within this time frame. Like, I don't know how to hold. They can't handle jumping through the hoops to get tier one B within this time frame. They can't have staff, but it's got to have, you know, the only thing that's going to trigger Act 250 mm -hmm. is 50 units or more. Like I just, I, I'm not saying, I'm just flagging that, that that feels like a dissonance to me. Yeah. And I could understand that, um, how that can sound like a dissonance. And I think where, where I, where I come down to is trying to bring parity in Act 250 to how we regulate residential uses with how we regulate commercial uses. So right now, that community could have a 9.9 .9 acre commercial development. I can give a great example with seven buildings, 175 parking spaces, and a ton of traffic and have no Act 250 review. And we've lived with that system, and that's generally been okay. And to me, this is simply bringing residential development into that same parity that we have right now with commercial development. You know, when Act 250 came of age, we were growing at exponential rates with residential uses. And I think that's one of the reasons why residential is regulated more tightly. And we're kind of at the flip side now where we really should be thinking about how do we streamline the processes for residential. And I think at least bring it into parity with commercial jurisdictional triggers makes sense to me. 
I, I guess, um, and, and so you feel like that commercial uh, level of trigger is appropriate and okay? So therefore, I hear your parody comment. Yeah. I guess I'm just asking, is that? Uh, not being a planner, not <laughs> right. being a planner. Right. I think for the for the most part, yes. Yeah, I think just like with any process, you are not going to devise something that perfectly captures every issue that should be caught in a permitting process. And if you did, you'd probably design your way out of a process that allowed anything to happen. <laughs> so I think for the most part, it has worked. Thank you. Yeah, and really when we have these more complicated projects to get to that discussion of municipal staff, Often the municipalities will call us. We have an instance right now where we're acting as a town planner for one of our smaller towns for a very small subdivision that they thought was a little complicated. So they called us and we come in and we help advise them. Thank you for your testimony. Um, next we have Charlie Baker. <laughs> Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the time today. Um, so um, I guess I'll start off. Uh, so Charlie Baker, Executive Director of the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission and also uh, Chair of the Government Relations Committee for our state association. Um, and speaking to you, for, I think we really from with both those hats on. Um, one, uh, one thing I'll say first is I will coordinate in getting you written comments with Catherine. So you get one set of comments from the RPCs. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to make that uh, clear. Um, and then um, I have, sorry, I'm not quite sure how to ask this and I hope it's not impertinent, um, but we sent some language to, uh, to you last Friday um, with kind of the regional planning portion of what needs to change in statute. And I don't know uh, to what extent, I was gonna kind of re maybe preview a little bit of that. That would be great. Now. We oh. haven't incorporated it, we haven't talked about it. This would be a great time to do that. Excellent. All right, we're on the same page. <laughs> and I'm happy to share with the whole committee if that would help, or I don't know, I don't want to get in the middle of your processes. Um, let me know. <laughs> That's great. Share it. Please share it. Be, okay, you want to share it? I will do that. Friday at four, I was driving home. <laughs> <laughs> I think or actually, I'm probably still, still, still here. Yeah. I was hoping for a driving <laughs> Apologies for the, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you got no emails over the weekend either. Um, and um, so I guess, um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in generalities. Uh, so I'm not giving you a real specific comments yet on 687, but Catherine and I will coordinate on some of these. Um, one is when we talk about um, both the 1A and the 1B, um, hoping to see a little stronger connection to the mapping that we're doing in other section of statute. Um, and so, and that might actually help um, reduce the number of criteria that need to be in this section of statute because we've already addressed some of those criteria when we were doing our planning and mapping work. Um, so that's, I'll express that as a hope. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we'll try to uh, be a little clear about that kind of process piece. Um, and the other thing, you know, coming out of the NRB study, and I apologize, I didn't hear the earlier testimony, so I hope I'm not uh, duplicating uh, comments you've already heard, but um, the conversations we were having in the study committee process, uh, particularly around 1B, was the desire to be as inclusive as possible I'm a little concerned if we stay close to the criteria that's in there right now, um, it probably will work for Chittenden County and not too well for the most of the rest of the state. Um, so I say that with my Chittenden County hat on, <laughs> acknowledging like, yeah, that might work for us, uh, but I'm not sure it helps get housing in the rest of the state uh, where we need housing everywhere in the state. Um, so that's a little bit of a concern, I think that we'll follow up on, you know, but what other criteria? And I think we were, the conversation in those committees, to my best of my understanding, was to try to be more, particularly in 1B, like almost any place that had a village center designation ought to have the ability or uh, the opportunity to uh, participate in having some housing growth to support their small villages. Because um, it's just, I don't know what how to think about that rural economic development, but every part of the state ought to be able to uh, participate in some housing growth that supports their villages. 
Um, so that's kind of a general um, comment I wanted to make. And sorry. I'm really, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Do, sure. you, do you think that Act 250 is inhibiting housing growth in our small villages? Um, at least as a perception. Mm -hmm. um, so in, um, and I ran a regulatory program before moving to Vermont. The what's in our regulations does matter. So yeah, you know, to the extent that somebody might want to do a 10 or 12, you know, unit building it adjacent to a village or in a village, I do think Act 250 is definitely a barrier for that. Um, so we know the extent of that. It's it's kind of trying to prove a negative. Yes. Um, so I, I couldn't. I don't think there's a way to put numbers to that. Um, but I do think it's getting a lot of nine unit buildings in these villages. I'm yeah, no, I, can... I guess I'm always a little stymied by this perception. Yeah. And, I, I, and our ability to play into it. I would suggest you talk to more builders and stuff. I'm not, you know, I don't do that into the market, but it is part of my perception. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, would it be fair to say that Act 250 is, is not fair for the entire parts of the state? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, but I think that's certainly potential. Well, it's 30 miles between Island Pond and Canaan, and there's a lot of land, so anybody could build something in the middle of something. Burlington doesn't have that option or that luxury. So I believe that Act 250 does apply to the same thing in Burlington area as it does in Essex County. But should it? Um, no, I do think... Um, the study that you asked for, which was what kind of more location-based jurisdiction, I mean, the fundamentals of what are in the studies, I think, are trying to get at that. Like, let's be more thoughtful about where are we trying to not encourage growth and where are we trying to encourage growth, uh, you know, tier one, tier three, right? Um, so I do think that that is the right approach, and that is certainly more traditional planning. Um, you know, right now, Act 250 is very much an impact analysis, right? If you cross a threshold, you know, 10 units or or 10 acres or whatever the threshold might be. There are all, all, quite a few triggers, right? Um, Act 250 reviews your impact on all, all 10 criteria, um, but it doesn't have any place-based association. And um, I think when we were in here testifying a week or two ago, to, to us, I think this is really the opportunity to update the regulatory system to help support the planning processes that you know, have been required for quite some time for regions and towns. So this is why I think we're so excited and energized about the opportunity here to have Act 250 updated to better support the plans that are happening at the regions and towns. Yeah. Um, so Mayor Chair, I'll give it just, I'll do kind of just an intro of some of the uh, uh, thoughts, the key thoughts, particularly around uh, future land use element. Um, so the language we sent you, um, one particular thing it does is calls out a specific natural resources and working lands, land use element. There hasn't been one of those required uh, to date, although there was quite a bit of language that came from Act 171 back in 2016 around forestry and things like that. Uh, so we're kind of retaining some of that language and having it be in its own element. Um, and then what uh, we're suggesting is uh, a future land use element so actually, I should, for your, all of your benefit, let you know what elements are required in a regional plan. Uh, so we're suggesting there be a natural- Already required. What's that? Elements that are already required. Yeah. Um, what are you following? Are you going through on the pages of your- um, Yeah, I'm on page 14 of what I sent you, if, uh, if, if Word is working in, properly. Is it, yeah. Um, well, it's on our page. So- um, Number one is a statement of basic policies to guide future growth. Number two is currently the land use element we're suggesting that turns into a natural resource uh, element. The third element is an energy element. Uh, the fourth element is transportation. Fifth is utility and facility. So that's uh, kind of all your uh, water, sewer, uh, schools, public safety, uh, things like that. Number six is policies on uh, uh, rare and irreplaceable natural areas and quality of uh, water quality. Um, maybe that should go into the natural resource section, but I didn't mess with that too much. 
Um, number seven is kind of the information <laughs> section. Number eight is uh, just about uh, development trends. So a little bit of kind of analysis. Number nine is the housing element. Number 10, economic development. Number 11, flood resilience. Um, and if you're not exhausted yet, um, welcome to our world. Uh, we're proposing a kind of a new future land use element that would be very clearly uh, dictate the nine land use areas that we presented to you. Uh, God, I can't remember when that was, a week or two ago. Um, so, you know, the planned growth area, the downtown village centers. Um, and the one thing I want to call out to your attention is we did spend some more time trying to give uh, criteria to what should be required for planned growth area in our mapping. And it's very similar to the criteria you were just talking about for 1A and 1B. Um, so that's that's a place where I hope we can kind of get some statutory efficiency and not and make sure we're uh, really lined up and talking about the same criteria. Um, that's on page 19 to 20 of uh, the draft that we sent. Um, and so and village areas and those three areas our downtown village centers as area one, the planned growth area and the village area, which is the area around the designated village centers. Those are the three areas that we think encompass 1A and 1B the way they've been talked about. Um, and the way we've been thinking about this, I'm gonna move past the centers because I think everybody's in a very good place around centers. The downtown board should still bless the centers for the tax credit programs, et cetera. Um, but the 1A um, process, in our minds, we were hoping to identify the areas that could be eligible to apply to the NRB for exemption. Um, and so we're looking at what they have in their plans. Are they planning for higher density? Are they, uh, do they have all the infrastructure that they need? Uh, are they talking about um, meeting the housing targets that were required in the Home Act last year? Um, things like that. Um, are they trying to reduce sprawl? Uh, and uh, and strip development. Um, so, in that area, there is both one A and one and one B towns. We think there's some that will have done the bylaw work. Again, we're looking at kind of what the infrastructure, what they have, and their plans. Uh, those that have done the bylaw work would apply to the NRB for exemption. And then the other planned growth areas that haven't done the bylaw work mm -hmm. would be one B communities where they would get you know some some level of exemption um, or some allowance of a uh, number of housing units that could go in. Um, and then the village areas, you know, we have been thinking that those would be pretty close to automatically in 1B, um, just based on the criteria uh, and the definition that we have here to be, again, this is all about trying to be as inclusive as possible across the state. Uh, so that they would qualify for whatever benefits come with 1B. Um, so that's where we had been coming from and thinking uh, in terms of supporting the NRB study work um, and what our municipality has been planning for. Yes, sir. One vision with 1B, though, that they have to be, they have to have, that, they have to have bylaws and they have to have some parts in place because if we're talking about, like, I do, I do acknowledge Catherine's point about um, the tenant for development, commercial development versus housing. Um, isn't part of the goal here to get those towns to at least get them to move up the ladder a little bit and <laughs> with not making it onerous, um, yeah. but making it making it possible. But so you would designate them as eligible, but then still a process that you know, was sewer or water. Um, I guess that's a policy choice. I mean, we were on the kind of more inclusive side. Like if the NRB approves our regional plan and the map um, that includes these one B village areas that they would automatically qualify. Um, but that's a policy choice. I mean, that would be more inclusive. You could make it less inclusive. Um, I'm very much in like favor of the, you know, the housing consumption one, but it's have to make it possible, but don't you have to have some review mechanism for that. Yeah, I know you had A and R, but certainly want to have. Um, you know, we have a wide variety of of uh, rural towns, so um, you know, we were trying to just be as most inclusive as possible. The way we phrased it right now um, it was, is very broad, 
uh, it's really around the village center. You know, if they got a village center designation, then they probably ought to be able to support that village with some housing adjacent. Uh, it's kind of where we're coming from. Um, the What we uh, came up with as a definition in talking to our peers uh, across the state was a, a very broad or criteria, water, sewer, or bylaws. Um, so they have some, they got something that will allow some ability to grow, but not all of them. Um, so again, that, I think that's the crux of the, the, the policy debate here, how, you know, open or how easy or hard do we want to make it? Um, and your village centers that you're referring to are designated through the future land use mapping? Um, we would we would delineate them on our maps. I mean, right now, of course, they've been approved by the downtown board. We're still thinking that the downtown board would have you know some role in reviewing that, but at least the NRV would approve our maps so that that uh, the staff at DHCD isn't spending a lot of time kind of debating with towns on maps. We're doing that at the front end. But, I know you're using this for designated. I mean, one of the whole purposes of the work we're doing is that the, the downtown board was not isn't isn't a land use regulation body, and that right. we're hoping that some more robust planning happens. Yeah. And I just I don't want to. I want to make sure we're talking about the same thing. I mean, are you talking about rolling every village center that's already existing into this one B automatically? That is where we were starting from. Yeah. Yeah, I think this kind of came from, you know, and, and Catherine, uh, I'll ask her to pipe in, but, you know, as we were talking about this over the summer and fall, you know, I think every RPC has small towns that, you know, in their town plan, they talk about, we'd like to have more housing growth adjacent to our village or in our village. Um, and, you know, is this something that we could do to try to encourage that? That's where we were coming from. Yeah, I'm going to Representative Stebbins dissonance observation of, I mean, if you don't have water or sewer, how would you possibly be able to support 50 units of housing? Oh, uh, well, I mean, that's, that's a max number, right? And so, I mean, maybe it's only six units and they're on septic because they have good, you know, the soils perk there. And we were like, that's okay. But six units there, great. And which could happen now. It happened now is my right. point. Activities yeah. not keeping those from oh, happening. I agree with you. Anywhere. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that point. Um, and this is, you know, I think there's just some optics too about like, no, we're trying to say, no, you're, you're, this is a place we want to have housing. Um, yeah. And so does that answer your question? So Catherine, anything that I misspeak at all? I think that's what's in our report. <laughs> I'm thinking of ideas to it. I've been thinking, <laughs> jotting notes for ideas to address these questions and concerns. Yes, Thank you. Uh, how big a housing unit uh, could you put out in, in a 10 or a 20 acre or a 30 acre field that could build its own sewer system and sustain? Is, is there such a thing or would it, is it even possible? Oh, uh, yeah, depending on the soils. I mean, uh, how soil, many bedrooms you want? Soil perk perfectly. Right. And you build a 50 unit uh, complex and, and build a sewer system that would accommodate it? I would not be surprised if there may be some community uh, systems here that probably are around that size. Yeah, I mean, obviously doing wastewater. I mean, uh, you know, and we're talking about uh, community septic kind of system in a way. Um, you know, it was a very expensive thing, which is why you need a lot of properties to do it, you know, versus a, a centrally piped, you know, yep. sewer system, right? Um, but I think, I think there's a wide range of things that can happen. Would you say that chances are no one is going to want to build a 50 unit complex yeah, I think the, the, that's, that's off uh, municipal sewer? Yeah, I would hope not. And they're, and they're going to trigger Act 250 if they're not in sure. 1A or, or 1B, right? Um, so uh, there would be some barriers, financial, regulatory, and others uh, to, to doing that. And I think that's really what we're trying to, I think, we, I say we very royally, <laughs> the conversation is, you know, how do we influence the private sector behavior to get more of what our plans are calling for? Um, and so that's, that's kind of where we were coming from. 
Uh, I agree with you. It doesn't make anybody do anything. It doesn't make any. Doesn't make a fifty-unit development happen just because up to fifty is exempt from Act Fifty. Um, it would just make it a little easier uh, if they were bumping up against some barrier. So, yeah. Representative Tory, uh, just a question here. So, um, I heard eighteen months for the future land use mapping process. From Peter this morning. Okay. Um, and I'm wondering, um, so you're talking about local plans that are currently envisioning where growth might be, but often that's not informed by any soil testing. Um, there may not have been much movement yet about that. So as town plans get updated, and um, I'm just wondering, how does the border, what if a town were to have a very robust community visioning process after flooding, for example, mm -hmm. where you're really thinking about where is it safe to, to live? Maybe it's not mm -hmm. in our middle center. Right. Um, that kind of determination could take some time on the local level. Are the maps going to be dynamic to account for on the ground local agency around this as their um, insights and planning kind of matures? Yeah, I think uh, we've been viewing this all very iteratively um, and um, I was going to use the term ladder, but I think it maybe it's been getting used in the designation process too, so I won't, um, although I just did. Uh, but <laughs> you know, that there's a, a path for moving up this, this uh, hierarchy of places, right? Um, and it is iterative um, and dynamic, although it's sometimes slow. <laughs> but, you know, every time I think we've been... Uh, talking, you know, we're kind of anxious to get started doing this work. So, you know, we want to have as clear direction and statute as we can, uh, both in tier one and tier three. Um, sorry, I know we'll talk about that another time, but um, because we want to get started, it doesn't mean that everything has is resolved. And yeah, and if we, let's say we got a plan up, our plan updated in 2025 and we're now coming to the NRB asking for approval of our plan uh, that a town could very well be updating their plan the next year or so. And then, you know, we're always interacting with our towns as that's happening uh, before they even start the planning process. And certainly, um, you know, if this is starting to require them to get their plan approved, uh, great. Um, so, you know, we would kind of like be kind of capturing notes of like things that we need to update in our next cycle. And we were trying to outline a process where um, kind of small amendments could happen quickly to our regional plan without having to go through, uh, a, you know, the two public hearing, this six month process that uh, we typically have to do when we do the full plan update. We'll, uh, you know, we'll follow, I'll fo we'll follow up with that uh, draft bill language and some more specific comments on 687. Right, the, the draft bill language that you sent us, or that mm. okay, um, yeah. And there was some stuff at the end of that. Um, sorry, just transparency that um, where we were starting to try to uh, address some of the other issues that were coming up, like uh, how B Trans uh, engages. Right now, they they engage through Act Two Fifty. If Act Two Fifty is not there, how would they engage with municipal permitting processes, um, things like that, and and even for RPCs. Um, having a voice in municipal permitting uh, for uh, significant regional impact projects, SRI projects, like without Act 250, that goes away. So there was some stuff at the end there that um, uh, I'll, I will call the thoughts half-baked, but we were trying to kind of flag there are some other parts of statute that we probably need to address uh, as we think about this whole system. Uh, I've had some more conversation with VTrans. I think they'll have some more specific thoughts about their, their particular section of statute. But. Thanks for your testimony. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. First, we're going to take a brief break till two. We're going to reconvene our hearing, and uh, our next witness is John Grove with the BNRC. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. So, for the record, I'm John Groveman. I'm the Policy and Water Program Director for the Vermont Natural Resources Council. So, you've already heard, a, you know, you, you know, you've heard a lot about the specifics of one A and one B. So I just want to start by saying, just for the record, that you know, BNRC 
as a member of the NRB steering committee, um, support the tiered approach to jurisdiction, feel that it makes sense to um, alter Act 250 to create jurisdiction based on location, um, tier 1A and 1B based on planning and the RPC mapping work, which I'll talk about a little bit more as I drill into how, how the designations are gonna work for those tiers. We think that makes sense to base it on, base it on planning, um, for both the 1A and 1B areas, and importantly for tier three as well, the critical resource areas. So we think um, this is a good way to proceed, but there are some details that are not in the NRB report. Um, and then there's some, there are some provisions in there about process that I just wanted to raise as you're writing legislation to implement the tiered review that I wanna put on the table for discussion and I think need to be fleshed out in the legislation. But first I wanna say that, so VNRC, the, the NRB report with regard to 1B, the discussion that you just had with, um, with Charlie Baker. So we support 1B areas having zoning and subdivision bylaws, uh, water, sewer, or the uh, soils that would support <clears throat> development. You know, at the NRB report, doesn't it, we didn't talk about uh, you know, village areas that didn't have, you know, water or sewer qualifying. So I just want to note that. I mean, we support what's in the report. And the reason, you know, I think for the 1A and 1B exemption areas, really you, the principles are you want to make sure that the towns have good zoning, good subdivision for 1A. They have to have a high uh, capacity to administer that zoning. So they'll be providing the protections and they have infrastructure to support the development. And we're taking advantage of the investments that we've made, you know, I think it's appropriate as the NRB report outlines in 1B, because they're smaller villages, if those villages can take advantage of alternative waste disposal mechanisms that are allowed under a &R rules, that we think that makes sense. But I just, it's hard to envision towns not having water or sewer being able to, um, you know, qualify. So I just wanted to note, to note that. Um, also, so with regard to um, 1A, um, you know, one of the compromises in the study is for these Act 250 exemption areas where you do have to jump through, you know, hoops that are significant, quality zoning, quality subdivision, the ability to administer those programs. Um, it basically is the core area around like what right now are our downtown areas in our village centers, and then an area that can accommodate 20 years of growth. So that's significant. And we did agree to that, and we do agree to that, but we do think that there needs to be in the legislation clear guidance and criteria to the RPCs and the state designation board um, as to like how those boundaries get drawn for 20 years. Because that, you know, that is there's no real limit to that area. And so I think there needs to be thought. And, you know, um, discussion between the, the NRB and the RPCs, you know, and, and the VNRC's planners will provide input. But I do think that should be in the legislation, some sideboards, you know, around how those areas get on in 1A. In 1B, it doesn't, it doesn't speak to specifically how wide those areas are. You know, as a starting point, right now we have a neighborhood development area designation, which I think in our view is the best designation program in terms of dealing with development issues. It's, it's, the, it's the last designation program we created and it was created you know, with the idea of not duplicating efforts if towns had good land use programs, you can maybe have exemptions from Act 250. And in that program, there's a, 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 quarter, mile, um, it's a quarter mile radius from the downtown center or village center that kind of goes out and that encompasses the mapped exemption area. So we think that the, the starting point for that discussion should be the NDA program with 1B because those are towns that the zoning will not be as high quality um, and the capacity to administer the program won't be the same as 1A. So I wanted to put that out for your, just to think about and for discussion. I have a question. Yes. It's 20 years of growth. When we see growth ebb and flow quite dramatically over the years, what does that mean to you? I mean, I think it, it, it's a good question. And, um, you know, I, I think the RPCs might be better answering it, but I think it's based on projections of growth and census data and, uh, 
projections of housing needs and other needs in the community. But it is an estimate and it's, you know, it's, a, it's an analysis that is a planning analysis, basically. I just think it's interesting because we've seen our housing stock actually grow while our population hasn't grown commensurately because of things we've been talking about, like short term rentals and potentially fewer like people living in larger areas. But I think we're building houses, but our population is pretty, pretty stable. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, let's raise your hand. I don't know how this works exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think it's a good question. I, I I would start with the RPCs. You know, they would they would be drawing these boundaries initially, um, but it's clearly allowing for a latitude, and that's why we're saying that the legislation should have some sideboards and guidance about how that analysis is done. So, do you have thoughts on those sideboards? I I, I need to consult. This is why it's a little like I I'm a I'm not a planner. I'm a lawyer and a water policy person, and Brian. Shoop and Katie Gallagher like, are really expert. We can provide that information, but I prefer, I like to consult with them. Great. Thanks. Yeah. We look forward to getting that. Yeah. You have something to yeah. ask? Uh, just, I think uh, household sizes have been going down pretty dramatically over the last few decades. So even if we have the same amount of houses or slightly more, we have larger need. This family size is a lot smaller. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't dispute any of that. The other thing, yeah, that you're thinking about is talking about twenty years of growth implies they're just going to get bigger and bigger. We also need some way, it seems to me, to ensure that they are truly uh, fully utilized, mm -hmm. or and so. Do you have any thoughts about that? Because you know we have. I really, yeah, I really, I don't think I'm the best person to get into the specifics of this, but I mean, I, I just like from common sense, I think I can cut a lot of 20 years of growth. The projections could be, you know, that there won't be that, you know, that, that, that you know, there'll be times when you won't project that much growth, but I agree. It's a, uh, it's, 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 it's not a clear analysis of how it would be done. I think the idea was to make room for, especially the amount of housing that we think we need, but I think that varies from region to region and area to area. But I think it's something that needs to be nailed down as you go and you try to take this report and make it make it law. Um, similarly, in the 1B tier, so the NRB report says if you qualify for 1B, that one project could have up to 50 units and not go through Act 250. And we support that. But one thing we talked about at the NRB, and it's not reflected in the report, but I don't recall that there was really great objection to it was I think the idea is to have denser developments, you know, and I, I don't, we, we talked about in the NRB steering committee, even the housing developers didn't think you'd see one project, 50 units. That's pretty much the upper limit from what we heard. Um, we, we heard from Kathy Byer was sort of the affordable, was the affordable housing representative. And she was saying 30, maybe 40 units is what she would think we would see. But we talked about making sure that was dense. So we were, we were thinking that maybe in 1B, it should be 50 units per project, but on 10 acres, so not spread out. So that uh, 10 acres is a lot. 10 acres is not small, but 10 acres is, these are 10 acre towns. These are towns with zoning and subdivision under Act 250. So for commercial development, it's a 10 acre trigger. So we're just looking for a way to kind of keep, make sure that we have dense, more affordable housing in these 1B areas. So we wanted just to put on the table that for consideration as we're writing this into law, 1B, if you're designated 50 units, but one project on, on 10 acres, not sprawled out over more than 10 acres. Um, and finally, which is, this is in the report, and I think this, I hear a lot of support for this, is that, you know, it didn't name the NRB as the designation authority for the tier 1A and 1B and tier 3 areas. Um, but we think it should be the NRB. If we're going to professionalize the NRB and invest in the NRB, um, and have qualified people um, on the NRB per the uh, the bill that you that you that that has been introduced in this committee um, that has the environmental review board. I think the qualifications and the process for appointing that board would be the same. Let's use it for these designations. If not, we can debate the appeals part of it. I know that's going to be debated separately, but at a, at a minimum, 
the NRB should do these reviews. It should be a process. It should be an outline through NRB or the ERB, whatever we ended up calling it, rules about who could participate. Uh, the NRB steering committee report envisions that these designation decisions, because they will result in, in exemptions from Act 250, would be appealable decisions. So there'll be a lot of accountability built in, and we support that. But we think it's it's really important if we're you know creating this system where we're gonna we're gonna have these tiered jurisdictional areas in Act 250 and areas where Act 250 won't apply. So the last thing I want to talk about is is the process for um, drawing these tier one. A, one B, and tier three areas, um, and the design and, and the designation process. And something I've been thinking about looking uh, at the NRB report, looking at the VAPTIC report that includes the future land use mapping, which you've heard a lot about, including today, is I think as we as this becomes legislation, we should create an efficient process and not duplicate efforts. I think everybody wants this to move forward, you know, as fast as as it can, you know with good planning work done. And the way the way the reports read together now is that the RPCs working with the towns would create these future land use maps, which would include boundaries for a number of different categories, but including what would really be analogous to the 1A, 1B categories in the, the growth areas, the planned growth areas, and the, the core sort of downtown and village areas. And then the NRB report says that, you know, towns could apply to the state board for an Act 250 designation for 1A and 1B or Tier 3, but it's, it leaves it up to the town entirely. And it says the town could either go with the RPC recommendation or draw its own map. And I just, I think I want to put on the table for discussion if that, that's the right way to do this. Because if the RPCs are going to spend all this time like drawing these maps and working with the towns and going back and forth, and we want to go fast both on 1A and 1B and on Tier 3, protecting their critical resources, well, why don't we use that as a starting point? Like, why would we want to let the towns kind of rework that? Like, why, would, why wouldn't we want to say that those RPC boundaries, once uh, approved in the regional plan, um, is what needs to go to the state board for the designation and not like rework, not kind of have like this debate between the towns about um, what the map should be for tier 1A, 1B and tier three to get their critical resource designation. So I just want to put that on the table. I think it's really important when that part of the bill gets drafted about the process from going from the uh, regional planning commission, future land use mapping, up to the designation board for the designations that we don't duplicate efforts and we kind of we move we move this along and the other the last thing I want to say about this is um, and you know I I I think also like what's it's been a problem in the past that towns haven't taken these recommendations for designations to the right now is the downtown board that does these designations and there is concern and we're concerned that you know, these recommendations from the RPC won't be implemented. Um, and we've seen this before, you know, in the water world, we have uh, watershed plans, basin plans, watershed basin plans, where there's a lot of planning work and they say, well, this is a high quality water that should get the class A highest quality designation. This is a class one wetland that should get the highest protection and it's in the plan. And then no one goes to the Agency of Natural Resources to do that designation and it never happens. So it lies in the plan. We have all this work that's done to identify these important resources, and then they're not protected because nobody takes action on it. And so I, I think we should talk about what that what the process should be. One idea would be the RPCs as they're doing their mapping evaluation. And I think Charlie actually alluded to something like this when he testified before me, was that they would identify, hey, we think you're a one A town. Hey, we think that you're a one B town. We think that you've got good zoning. You know, we think you have the capacity to implement the zoning. You know, you have water or sewer, the infrastructure. And, you know, we should talk about if they make that recommendation, should the RPCs then take that? Like not just wait for the towns to do it. Should that go 
to the board so we make sure we get the, the designation and not just for 1A and 1B, but for tier three. I'm you know, really concerned about the tier three resources being identified by the RPCs, you know, be mapped out and then not, nothing happens with them. And then we don't really get locational jurisdiction at the end of the day, right? If none of, if this doesn't go all the way through, we basically kind of, we're, we're, we're where we are today, you know? So I just, I, in the last few days, reading all of these things together, I, this is a, something that's really kind of um, grabbed me. And now that we're writing legislation, I, I just think it, it, it needs to be discussed and debated. Like, what's the approach to this? Both to not duplicate efforts between the RPC mapping and the mapping of the designated areas that go to the board and making sure this actually happens. Um, and that we just don't get a bunch of great maps and plans that aren't, that aren't acted on. Thank you for your testimony. Basically what I have today. From Representative Bongard. It's not acted on by the, by the community. Well, the way, the way it's kind of set up now would be by the, the towns wouldn't bring it forward. The towns don't bring it forward, then it doesn't happen, you know, to the state designation board. It'll get in the plan. They don't have, the towns don't have a choice about that. They will be engaged. The RPCs, it's, We'll work with the towns in drawing these maps and boundaries and identifying these critical resources. So that has to happen. But then the designation step. My thinking about this has been that if it's on the future land use map, would the permits <clears throat> have a sponsorship regulatory effect through the active 50 process, whether it's been adopted by the town or not? Um, so think about whether yeah i mean yeah i just think of how to do I, I i think we really want to see these designations occur and so we have look we have true locational jurisdiction and so we can build housing in the 1a and 1b areas and there's not duplication where there doesn't need to be and we're protecting the tier three areas and we just don't have great plans that yeah that don't that don't really aren't fully realized representative Sibili. john what problem do you think we're solving for communities with these proposals that communities I, want us to solve? I think that there are communities that all over the state that do need more, especially multifamily housing um, for seniors, for affordable housing that doesn't, that doesn't exist. And, um, I don't think, you know, I don't think, you know, Act 250 is the, is, is created a housing problem. And I don't think all these changes will solve it, but I think um, having policies that encourage multifamily denser housing in areas, I think communities need that, you know, uh, I think communities realize they need that. I don't know that all communities make the linkage up with their zoning and with land use necessarily. And I don't know, you know, I can only, like, I'll use my, I live in Marshfield, a really small rural town northeast of here. And, you know, I've been on the planning commission for years. I've been on the DRB. And we have, our plan talks about we need more affordable housing. We need multifamily senior housing and identify all these needs. But we don't, and that's all in our plan. And, you know, but it doesn't really, you know, we need that, but we you know, we're not getting it, you know, I don't know that these changes will, it's not going to make it magically appear, but if it does encourage developers to come in and say, <coughs> you know, we, um, I, we have water and sewer in Marshfield. We have decent bylaws and subdivision. Maybe we could be a one B town. If we attracted a developer to do, you know, 30 units of, of housing and not go through active 50. Um, I think our community needs, like an apart a couple of apartment complexes and multifamily housing. Um, so I think that's the that's the that's the need. I think this will help. I don't think it's a panacea. I don't think it's gonna magically solve that problem. So can I ask a question on this? Yeah. We're a little behind. So if you all want to just wait outside and give one more witness on this, we'll come get you. Thanks. I was very intimidated. I didn't know what was happening. I thought I, was, I, thought I might be getting arrested. <laughs> Thank you when you go that way. Yeah. Like it's finally happened. This will be on YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> so um, 
you know, as I'm thinking about all of this and, you know, I shared some of this frustration with the chair, just my, my sense um, of, you know, I think our communities need a lot of help with climate change adaptation. Um, and I also think they're trying to figure out housing, you know, in my area, little towns, um, uh, you know, I think of all of the things that would come before we would ever even get to an Act 250 permit that are pretty huge barriers um, for them. Uh, and so <clears throat> just I'm, I'm sort of frustrated. I feel like these things are coming together in a way that is not actually helpful in explaining what we're doing to communities. Um, I think there's a real urgency around explaining the need for climate change. Not, not the need. Communities need help adapting to a changing climate. And, and these regulations are things that will help. I, I don't think we're doing a good job saying that's a problem we're hearing and seeing that we're trying to respond to. And, and we're kind of riding it in the back of housing, which is also an issue, and, and trying to Act two, you know, like if Act two fifty goes away, we're not going to magically have housing. I agree. I mean, the, the, so I'm so I'm so I'm so I'm really like I'm struggling with these things, the way that they're connected. I see that there are connections, but I'm really struggling, and I'm struggling with that being really the best um, explanation that we can give to Vermonters about what we're doing here. So just want to give that as feed. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, I I would you know I said this, and we we. We're trying to reward towns for good planning as well, you know, and say if you do the planning and zoning and you invest in the infrastructure, uh, you know, um, you know, they'll, they, they, they will be, uh, you know, a clearer path. If, if you, you still need a developer to want to come and build, you know, multifamily housing and affordable housing. And I, to your point, I mean, the other part of it is there are critical resources like from the climate change. I think the good planning in here will, you know, the river corridors and the floodplains and wetlands will be carved out from these growth areas. So there'll be an extra layer of protection. There are bills that are, are uh, in this introduced in this committee and that are going to come over from the Senate about, you know, river corridor and wetland protection. May, and may come over from the Senate. May <laughs> come over from the Senate. Yeah. Um, but it all related. I think that this is an opportunity and it's really exciting, like the agreement that Listen, you know, if we reward towns for good planning and investing in infrastructure and identify some critical resources that, um, you know, Act 250 would be helpful in protecting and make sure we're not developing on steep slopes in our forests and our headwaters, you know, and causing pollution and, you know, uh, exacerbating the potential for mudslides and all the things that we've seen, like using Marshfield again, you know, Marshfield happens to be, we abut the Groton State Forest. Marshfield's uh, zoning is 80% of our town is a conservation district. That is land that is on steep slopes and forests that just butt, abut the Groton State Forest. If you go look at the forest block maps, we have giant intact forests everywhere. So I think we've done a good job, like in Marshfield, you know, we had some visionary people from Goddard College, like in 1970, that wrote the zoning that way. But not every town did that, right? And um, we also had our own version of the road rule where the forest district basically starts, I think 800 feet from any road. So that's how we did it. I wasn't there, you know, I am old now, but I was not around in 1970 when they wrote that zoning. But for the towns that didn't do that, I, this will provide protection, you know, uh, for those issues as well. Thank you. We need to move on to yeah, your see. testimony. Yeah. We look forward to Welcome, Megan, Megan Sullivan. <clears throat> uh, hello, Megan Sullivan, Vice President of Government Affairs for the Vermont Chamber of Commerce. Um, thank you for having me back in. Um, I'll give a similar caveat that I am not a planner, uh, also not an attorney, um, which maybe will be endearing. <laughs> um, I, you know, I've spent so much time working on the this study, and so I really appreciate the opportunity to keep coming in to talk about the various parts of the NRB study and um, the bill we're looking at. Um, I know that some folks that have testified before me have talked about some of the, the concerns with, you know, if um, if towns are going to be able to manage the level of um, requirements 
that are listed um, to be one A or to be one B. Um, I think, you know, for our perspective, it's it is critical that communities have <clears throat> have the ability to to access this or to see the potential to access it. So if they are not there now, that that it's still achievable. Um, and so really looking at, you know, are are all of the pieces that we're asking for, you know, do they serve the purpose that we need? Um, should does the town need to be responsible for this piece? Are there other state agencies that are doing this work? Are the RPCs doing this work? Um, and then, you know, I think concerns on the timeline that um, if a board has to go to every municipality to talk about this, um, unless the board is hitting two municipalities a day, this is going to take a long time. Um, and I think there's um, a level of urgency in trying to make progress. Understanding good planning takes time um, and, and not trying to um, diminish that. Um, but there are, I, we have some concerns about the, the timeline that could come from having, a, you know, the board needing to go to every municipality. Um, and so I think, you know, as John was talking about using these, the regional planning commissions to, to um, be not a proxy, but to really congregate some of this information, engage with the towns, um, I think is important. I need a little clarification. You say the board needing to go to every town. What, what does that mean? There's, oh, I wish I had the page. There was a, a, a piece of the bill that talked about um, after the towns created their map for the um, district, the board would go to each municipality to review it in a public hearing. And the public hearings have to have a certain amount of notice. Um, so what do you mean, RPCs? What's that? You know, RPCs? No, that's not. The language that I saw said that the the board the, that's reviewing, unless it meant the RPC board, and I misread that. Yeah, we need to get clear on that. Just okay. get a chance, send us the... Yeah, I'll send you the specific line. But that, I'm okay, so good. I'm glad that could be fixed because that was a, a concern. Um, I do want to, some of the questions that came up, I uh, was excited because there was sort of more in my wheelhouse. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, so, and I think it's a really important question. You know, when we say grow over the next 20 years, um, wh what does that mean? And I think it's important. We have a lot of plans in the state that, um, that the legislature is passing. We need to have a plan for, um, you know, efficiency and climate change and um, childcare and a lot of plans. Um, and we don't necessarily have a housing plan in place with targets um, based on data that we're measuring when we pass housing legislation. Is this, did this help us meet our goals? I mean, we can sort of say like, yeah, that was great. But if we don't know if it's creating the change that we're looking for, um, it, it's hard to really know if if we're on the right track. Um, so in your, another House committee in um, House General and Housing, they are looking at a bill that talks about setting a housing goal and then creating um, the reporting to know our, how are we meeting that. Um, and that's work that the Vermont Futures Project has also done a lot of work on and sort of identifying um, what are the needs that we have in the state around people and places. Um, not just for our current population, but if we're looking at um, a vibrant economy in the future, as our demographics are getting older, um, we have 14,000 people retiring, 5,000 first graders. Um, we need to be filling our population. Um, and, and so that requires people and housing. Um, and I think, you know, Representative Sibelia brought up that our housing needs have changed. You have a lot more um, people who are staying single longer and need an apartment or um, two household families. Um, so those have changed and housing units that we have are coming offline as they're aging because we did a lot of building in the 70s and those houses are, are aging to a point where they're not necessarily staying on the market. And so VHIP is doing a little work to try and bring some of those back. Some are just going online. So um, I think the, 
the housing needs assessment that VHFA does is a good has so much data and is a good resource to understand, you know, if our population is stagnant and we do build 2,000 houses, housing units a year, what, where is this coming from? And they do a lot of work to define, you know, how many housing units we're losing every year um, just from age. Um, and then how housing needs in the community have changed. Um, so, you know, I think to, to answer some of that question, those are, um, that's a good resource to look at. Um, but I would also recommend talking to um, the House General and Housing Committee about their work around housing targets, uh, because I think that these all are interconnected. If we're saying, you know, that, that these current, designation areas aren't necessarily built for where we need to grow in 20 years, we also need to be thinking about, well, what does, what do we need to, what is growth for the next 20 years and not be guessing. Um, and I think the RPCs are engaged with the Vermont Futures Project, as well as with BHFA in their mapping to sort of look at the data that some of those organizations have. Um, and they might be able to speak more to that. Uh, but I think it's an, an important question. Um, and there is, there is from, from the data that we've seen, there is a need for, for growth. Um, and some, and that should be infilled, that should be up. Um, but there also needs to be account for out as well, so that we're not building the same houses and the same floodplains over and over again. There's going to probably need to be some adjustment <laughs> into new areas. Um, and um, to the question of, you know, what is this in response to? Um, I think of, um, you know, Jonah Richards, who um, has been in the news, a uh, small developer um, from Fairleigh, Vermont, who has said, you know, I built nine units of housing. I could have built 15 in a small community, but I didn't want to trigger Act 250. Um, and so some of it's in response to that. Right, I think Act 250 is not what's stopping housing. It's a piece of it and it has, whether real or reputational, it, it can have a chilling effect, especially for a small developer who doesn't have the staff and, and, and capital um, and is more nervous to go through that process um, to say, I'm just not going to, to put the houses in this community that the community needs and is asking for um, because they don't want to go through that process. Um, and if we can solve that in one way in our smaller communities by by making those smaller communities open to if you can if you can do 15 units there and that can be supported by the community, it can be supported by the systems in place, do 15 units there because we'd rather have those 15 units there than building them further out and out. Um, <clears throat> But if you are, um, you know, going to be building them further out now, it may need further reviews to really say, can we incentivize building in our village centers um, and in our downtowns? Um, I think another piece is when we're talking to our members, um, they're telling us, especially in rural communities, that a manufacturer in Morrisville may have um, staff coming in from the Northeast Kingdom because they can't find anywhere to live closer to their place of employment. And that means that they need an extra two hours of childcare because they have to drive an hour each way. Uh, and that means, you know, if they're, you know, just out of high school and getting their first job in manufacturing, um, their car has two extra hours of travel on it. Um, and that is really challenging. And so understanding um, and this is in, you know, looking at the tier 1A where there's um, certainly more overview, um, but those exemptions of saying, are we building complete communities where, you know, where communities are being thoughtful about where's our industrial and commercial and residential, um, and how do we incentivize those to be done in a smart way? Um, you know, you don't want a slaughterhouse next to an elementary school, but where you can still have that industrial use in a way that's um, that people can get to. So your employees can get there because we're investing in housing um, near where those employment areas are. And we have employment areas 
all over the state and incredible businesses all over the state. So I would say that's that's part of that why. I've sort of gone all over the place, but. <laughs> Thank you for your testimony. I'm sorry we're a little picked up okay. in time. That's okay. I'll be back tomorrow. We'll hear for you. Yes. We'll hear <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. And I'm there, right? Please. Thank you. Not sure if anyone's following me. <laughs> We're going to shift gears and maybe we go. <laughs> um, and welcome the the CUDs in to give us an update. Welcome, Ellie. Hi. So, do you uh, do you have the slides, Ms. Shantipur? Um, we probably have the slides. Yes. Usually we have, but there are. I can't see them from where I'm sitting. We usually have slides. If you wanted slides, you you can put them up yourself. So. Um, I can put Okay. Thank you. Okay, well, I'll get going while we're trying to get the slides organized. So, um, so I'm Ellie de Villiers. I'm the chair of the Vermont CUD Association, PUDA, and I'm the executive director of Maple Broadband. So thank you very much uh, for the time today. So I think we're here really just to give you an update as to where we are at this point and some of the challenges going forward. Um, so 2023, so you guys all know what's, what CUDs are. Um, we sent through some slides that you folks can have as a reference. Um, but just to remind you, um, under Act 71, we all have a universal service obligation to make sure that every, um, every on-grid address has access to high-speed broadband increase. So if you could go to the next slide, please. So these are, the, these are your CUDs. There's 10 of us. I'm going to fly through the, the first bit because we have very limited time. Next slide. And this... Uh, we presented this slide last year, so it's really just a reference to remind you of what we are as municipal entities and the mission and our obligations. And if you could go to the next slide, please. Really want to get to the meat of what we're here to talk about. So um, here's a couple of testimonials. I'm just going to read one of them to give you a flavor because I think we all understand the importance of high-speed broadband to the rural areas, the importance it is to, uh, to, to Vermonters. But just to take the time to read one of these, <clears throat> um, broadband internet service from DB5 was a key factor for me starting my own business and prevented us from moving elsewhere. We didn't want to leave Vermont, but needed work and finally came to the decision that it was our only option to survive. Our line of work necessitated high quality, high speed internet for remote work opportunities. So again, not to belabor the point, but we all understand the importance of the mission of what we're trying to do. Next slide. And this is showing some examples of 2023 success. Um, I'm not going to go into the details here, again, limited time, uh, but really 2023 was the year that many CUDs either kicked off construction or took construction, started the previous year, and actually launched active service. So NEK Broadband's one example. They have over 202 miles of active service. Um, my CUD, Maple Broadband, uh, we have... Uh, 112 miles at the time that this slide was done. I think there's a few more now, um, adding service all the time. And um, so it's it, it's great to see things that have been in the works for some years actually hit the ground. And so that's one of the messages is that the uh, the funding we've received and strategy to better public infrastructure, it's working. We're rolling it out. Um, CDs across the states are busy in deployment and getting people connected. And that's great, um, but we're not done and there are challenges to come. Next slide. So again, um, many CDs are in active construction right now. You can see in the first bullet, um, CB fiber, DB fiber, EC fiber, of course, and Maple and NEK, as on the previous slide. And uh, Otter Creek CD and Lamoille FiberNet will be starting construction this year and may even finish construction this year. Um, Southern Vermont uh, wrapped up last year its Act 71 obligations. Um, and then Northwest Fiber Works is 
expected to, um, they just put through their construction grant application, so they should be getting going this year as well. And going forward, the next federal program we have is uh, the federal BEAD program. It's very different from the ARPA program in that there are, there are a lot of rules and restrictions that came with federal funding. And so the state of Vermont, uh, the BCBB, has uh, spent a lot of time last year putting together the program rules that, that um, essentially let them do, let them follow through on the state strategy within the boundaries and the restrictions of the federal funding. So this is a very different program. It's much more complex than what we faced in the, in the past, and it's a competitive program. So there's no guarantee for us as CUDs that we will necessarily receive this grant funding because it has to be a competitive program with the private sector. So it's a very complex program, um, and it's, it's new for us, and it also comes with a variety of requirements, including match requirements. There's a 25% match, which can be in-kind or cash, and so this is, this is a big thing for us this year, is the VCUB actually is launching this program in the first half of this year. We're all going to be, well, I shouldn't say all, but many CDs will be submitting bids, and we want to make sure that we are, that we are placing successful bids. So there's a lot of effort going into that program. Um, and then finally, yes, uh, Vakuda is doing our best to make sure that we are as efficient as we possibly can and working together and not reinventing the wheel and um, breaking down those silos and making sure we're collaborating and efficient and cost efficient. Next slide. Okay, so this is the this is the meaty one. This is our this is our challenges that we're currently dealing with. Um, so I mentioned the bead program earlier. Um, the second one is really that as the CDs are for the most part um, EC fiber is a notable exception, and not every CD has exactly the same model. But for many of us, we are essentially startup infrastructure businesses. And yes, we're spending the money. Yes, we're building the network. Yes, we're getting folks connected. It's very rewarding. But we are also startups, and we don't yet have the turnover or the balance sheets that enable us to do some of the things that our B competitors can do. Um, and so this is this is really uh, this is the challenge that we're faced with. Um, so, and I think the other the other point here is that um, Act seventy one required us to build to the unserved and underserved or any routes necessary to get to them. And this is actually the opposite of what you do if you were a commercial company building a viable business. You would start with the denser, more profitable areas. And then once you had a solid business under your feet, you would build to the less profitable or unprofitable areas. We've actually built the unprofitable areas. And at the same time, again, we're in a competitive market, the private sector realizing that if they didn't do it, we would, has built out in many, er in many cases, some of the most profitable areas of our district which take them off the table for us. So that means that um, our, our, the, the need in terms of where we need to bring CUD fiber is smaller, but it also means that the business footprint is different. And I don't want to say weaker because it's not always necessarily weaker. In some cases, it actually can make, uh, paradoxically, for a bit of a stronger business case because you can be a, a greater percent grant funded. But my point is it's a, it's a dynamic environment. And just as a policy matter, it's important that you folks appreciate that uh, some C CUDs are, are building or have built in uh, in the rural, less profitable areas. And so these areas, uh, the cost to build is higher. There's fewer people. Incomes tend to be lower. And so any sort of ongoing taxes and fees um, that's, that hits predominantly rural areas that are based on things like coal per mile or miles of, uh, of infrastructure in rural areas, they'll disproportionately hit business cases, which may be weaker um, overall because they have more rural miles. So I apologize. I'm really flying through this because I know that we're, we're kind of under the gun here um, in terms of timing. And to find that, finally, that brings me to affordability. So affordability is uh, it's not a new challenge. Um, as you folks may all well be aware, the Federal Affordable Connectivity Program is projected to run out of funding in April of this year, unless Congress somehow manages to extend it, um, which is probably somewhat unlikely. So what that means for Vermont, Vermont is receiving about $9 million a year from the federal government, or Vermonters are, rather, as credits off the broadband bills. It's about 25,000 Vermonters just over that receive that benefit, um, of which under 200 are CUD customers. So that shows that a lot of the people receiving the benefits are in the towns and the cities. So affordability is a challenge. It's a CUD challenge, but it's actually a statewide challenge. And if you were to take um, just the 10% of Vermonters, give or take 10.4% that are at the federal poverty line, in order to replace that subsidy, that's on the, on the order of about $24 million. And that's really, if, if everyone were to be enrolled in an ACP equivalent, $30 a month, 
And so that's really just a floor because again, poverty line, get 100% of poverty. If you're at 150% of poverty line, you're still struggling to pay your bills. And again, in the rural areas, your broadband bill may be $60, $70 a month, $30 off that may still be unaffordable. So affordability is, is a big challenge and something that um, we wanted to be raising and discussing with you folks because there's only so much that we can do, again, as, as startup businesses and as businesses that are serving these, uh, these difficult economic areas. So that's, that's pretty much it. The last slide is really just talking about um, how, what you all know, but CUDs is a, are a great combination of professional staff that have been there, done that, um, as well as the volunteers and, uh, and the local towns. We have 213 towns are members of CUDs. And, um, and again, you all understand the local governance aspect of that and that wonderful, unique mix that we have in Vermont. So, is that fast enough for you? That was great. Thank you for your testimony. I would love to just take a second to have folks introduce themselves who you brought with you. Say maybe what town you're from and also which CUD you're from. If you don't okay. mind. You want to start FX? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, FX Flynn. I uh, live in Hartford in the uh, Queechee Village area. I uh, am the chair of the governing board of the East Central Vermont Telecommunications District, which owns and operates the business you know of as EC5. My name is Krista Shute. I'm the executive director for NEK Broadband. We cover uh, the counties of Essex, Caledonia, and Orleans, and the town of Wolcott in Wyoming. In Derby. In Manwaring. I'm one of the founders and now the vice chair of the Beat Fiber. We're 24 towns in three counties in southeastern Vermont. And a former representative. And a former representative. <laughs> <laughs> Tough to follow that. I'm Lisa Birmingham, <laughs> and I'm with I'm the executive director at Memorial FiberNet, uh, which is Memorial County plus a portion of Walcott um, and a little bit of Fletcher. Um, and I pick up my mail and stuff. That that will have to be for CUDs. Uh, Rob Vitsky, program staff for the CUDA, the Association of the Ten CUDs, and uh, I set up shop in Athens, Vermont, which is actually detailed territory. Great. And I'm Rob Fish. I'm the deputy director of the Vermont Community Broadband Board. I'm in Berlin. Thank you all for coming in. Do members have questions? Me? Yes. Uh, if, if I may uh, speak a little bit about the uh, legislation that we have uh, uh, before you is uh, H755, introduced by uh, Representative Maslin. Uh, this is largely uh, technical corrections in the CV. Uh, governance uh, provisions, uh, and I believe that uh, the Senate version introduced by Senator Clarkson, S-199, is probably going to be the one that uh, gets processed and, and comes through, and, uh, and that as that happens, it'll, it'll go to S Senate GovOps and then probably into House GovOps because it's mostly a GovOps thing. So I know you guys are really super pressed for time. So... I, I would just throw that out there that that um, that it's less of a that it's less of a CUD thing, more of a more of a, a government operations type of uh, type of legislation. Yeah, well, I actually think seven five five is on our wall, and it'll you, that, the Senate bill will probably come here too. Uh, yeah. So so I know you have jurisdiction and all. I'm just suggesting that it, it's n not so much you know energy and environment. Related. So, in lieu of that, tell us why you support it. Well, I drafted it. <laughs> so, what's <laughs> it's important? Okay, it's important. It's the problem it's trying to solve. And it, it, it's it's so the original CUD legislation was based on the 23 town contract that formed DC Fiber and the EC Fiber bylaws. Well, it turns out that not every one of the new CUDs wants to have their annual meeting on the second Tuesday of May. So, the new legislation says. The annual meeting shall be the second Tuesday of May, or as otherwise provided in the bylaws. Or as so, there's a lot of or as otherwise provided in the bylaws. There's also a section on how to merge two CUDs, uh, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, there are also provisions about uh, allowing us to have virtual meetings without needing to have a physical place, which is how we've been operating, uh, you know, from. Uh, basically, you know, once everybody had Zoom, 
so, you know, that's why I say most of this stuff is touching on GovOps type things. Yeah, and the, the mergers piece is actually somewhat time critical for us because you want to, that's the sort of thing that you want to have in place before you need it, not after you need it. And especially with the deed program this year to make CDs more competitive, CDs may wish to merge in order to put together a more competitive bid. Therefore, it'd be good to get this done so that it's there in place when CDs need it rather than having to wait for the next legislative session. I guess what BEAD stands for. Sorry, a BEAD is Broadband Equity Access and Deployment. That's the next round of federal funding. Okay, that's great. Thanks for your testimony and, and your, all, your hard work. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Thank you. Members, it takes us right up to about floor times because we will adjourn for the day and reconvene tomorrow morning.